Ukraine is Russia's next door neighbor. In Ukraine's neighborhood, natural gas is a pretty big deal. Russia on one side of Ukraine has a lot of it, while Europe on the other side does not. But Europe needs it, especially for heating homes in the winter. And guess where the gas pipelines that connect Russia to Europe, including Russia's largest pipeline, are located? That's right, Ukraine. Now, in 2006 and 2009, Russia and Ukraine couldn't agree on gas prices, so Russia cut off the gas supply, which also cut off the gas supplies to Europe. Now, obviously, having the ability to cut off gas supplies gives Russia a lot of power over Ukraine, and Ukraine's position as middleman in Europe's gas purchases makes Ukraine important to the world trade system as well. But aside from being an important location for fossil fuel transportation, Ukraine itself is a valuable treasure, because aside from being blessed with lots of fertile land perfect for growing food, it's also sitting on top of some enormous shale formations, which have yet to be fracked for natural gas. The largest of these formations is on the eastern side, the Russian side of the country. And there's also a lot of gas under the peninsula that hangs off the southern coast of Ukraine called Crimea. And while Ukraine has a lot of gas under its soil, it doesn't have the technology to frack it right now. So Ukraine is still largely reliant on Russia for its gas. And so keeping that in mind, here's a little bit of recent history. Back in 2011 and 2012, Ukraine needed money, and the International Monetary Fund was willing to give Ukraine some money if Ukraine's government, headed then by President Viktor Yanukovych, would change Ukraine's economic laws to make the country more open to multinationals. Some of the demands that were made by the IMF include they wanted Ukraine to allow multinational banks to buy Ukrainian banks, they wanted Ukraine to cut regulations limiting the extraction of profits by a bunch of other industries, they wanted Ukraine to limit the wages of government workers and cut government jobs, they wanted Ukraine to make cuts to their health and education spending. They wanted the government of Ukraine to eliminate subsidies that made gas prices more affordable for Ukrainian citizens. And the IMF wanted Ukraine to privatize their gas industry, which are some pretty tough strings. But it appeared for a while that the Ukrainian government was on board, the Ukrainian government headed by this guy Yanukovych, because they were starting the process of economic integration with the world trade system in return for that cash. Because in 2013, Ukraine's government was negotiating terms of an economic partnership with the European Union. And multinational corporations, knowing that privatization of Ukrainian assets was a demand, they were lining up to get a piece of the Ukrainian pie. For example, Ukraine signed a 50-year, $10 billion fracking deal with Chevron just a few weeks before the EU deal was supposed to be signed. However, two months before that economic partnership with the EU was to be signed, Russia threatened its next door neighbor Ukraine with sanctions, which are economic warfare, if it signed the EU deal. And then one week before Ukraine was supposed to sign the deal with the EU, Ukrainian President Yanukovych backed out of it. So instead of accepting the IMF money and integrating in economically with the market system, Ukraine accepted a deal from Russia that included a $15 billion loan, a price cut for natural gas, and Russia was demanding no changes to Ukrainian laws. Basically, President Yanukovych was offered the choice between entering the global economic system we've been pushing since World War II with strings or partnering with their next door neighbor with no strings. And Ukraine chose the stringless deal with neighbor Russia, or supposedly stringless deal. I mean, who knows? But that's when she hit the fan. So in December of 2013, a month after Ukraine backed out of its expected merge with Europe, anti-government protests happened in Ukraine. And there were some very strange guests at these protests, including Republican Senator John McCain of Arizona, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Rhode Island, and Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Victoria Newland. Now, as reported by Reuters, Senator John McCain not only attended the anti-government protests, but he got up on stage and told the protesters, quote, we're here to support your just cause, the sovereign right of Ukraine to determine its own destiny freely and independently, and the destiny you seek lies in Europe, unquote. Then, one week after returning from Ukraine, Senator John McCain spoke to another one of those creepy world leader groups, the Atlantic Council, and this is what he said. If Ukraine's political crisis persists or deepens, which is a real possibility, we must support creative Ukrainian efforts to resolve it. Senator Murphy and I heard a few such ideas last weekend, from holding early elections, as the opposition is now demanding, to the institution of a technocratic government with a mandate to make the difficult reforms required for Ukraine's long-term economic health and sustainable development. Decisions such as these are for Ukrainians to make, no one else, and if they request our assistance, we should provide it where possible. Finally, we must encourage the European Union and the IMF to keep their doors open to Ukraine. 
Ultimately, the support of both institutions is indispensable for Ukraine's future, and eventually, a Ukrainian president, either this one or a future one, will be prepared to accept the fundamental choices facing the country, which is this. While there are real short-term costs to the political and economic reforms required for IMF assistance and EU integration, and while President Putin will likely add to these costs by retaliating against Ukraine's economy, the long-term benefits for Ukraine in taking these tough steps are far greater and almost limitless. This decision cannot be borne by one person alone in Ukraine, nor should it be. It must be shared, both the risks and the rewards, by all Ukrainians, especially the opposition and business elite. It must also be shared by the EU, the IMF, and the United States. All of us in the West should be prepared to help Ukraine, financially and otherwise, to overcome the short-term pain that reforms will require and Russia may inflict. A few months later, in early February 2014, a phone call between the then Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Nuland, who was the lady who was in Ukraine supporting the protesters with John McCain and Chris Murphy. Well, a conversation between her and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, was leaked online. The call was real, and here's how I know. This is the then State Department spokeswoman Jen Psaki speaking to reporters the day after the call was leaked. Before we get back to Syria, mm -hmm. let's go to the real fire, or what seems to be the real fire mm -hmm. at the moment, and which is <clears throat> Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And um, so before we get into the actual substance of this conversation, this call that was recorded and, and released, um, can you say whether you, if this call is an authentic uh, record, a recording of, a, of an authentic conversation between Assistant Secretary Newland and Ambassador Pyatt. Well, I'm not going to confirm or uh, outline details. I understand there are a lot of reports out there, and there's a recording out there, uh, but I'm not going to confirm pr private diplomatic conversations. So you are not saying that you believe this is you, you think this is not authentic. You think uh, this is it's authentic? not an accusation I'm making. I'm just not going to confirm the specifics of it. Well, you can't even say whether there was the, the, this call you, that you believe that this call. Do you believe that this recording is a recording of a real telephone call? I didn't say it was inauthentic. I think we can okay. leave it at so that. So you're 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 allowing the for the you're allowing the fact that it is authentic. Yes. Do you have a yes. question about okay. it? <laughs> I love that smile on her face too. She's just like, I hate you. <laughs> and here's how another one of the reporters characterized what she and the rest of the world was hearing on that call. It's up to the people of Ukraine, including officials from both sides, to determine the path forward. But it shouldn't be a surprise that there are discussions about events on the this ground. This was more than discussions, though. This was two top U.S. officials mm -hmm. that are on the ground discussing a plan that they have to broker a future government and bringing officials from the U.N. to kind of seal the deal. This is more than the U.S. trying to... Um, make suggestions. This is the U.S. midwifing the process. And of course, I have the tape for you. Now, you can listen to the entire thing. It's about six minutes. I've put the links to that in this episode's show notes. But here are the highlights. Now, in this call, the State Department's Victoria Newland and U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, are discussing which of three people should be put in charge of the next Ukrainian government. The options were Vitaly Klitschko, who ended up becoming the mayor of Ukraine's capital city, Kiev, and he remains the mayor to this day. There was also Ola Tanibak, who was the leader of a party that focused on opposition to Russia and communism. And there was Arseniy Yatsenyuk, nicknamed Yats, the person who would become Ukraine's prime minister 21 days later. Good. So uh, I don't think Klitsch should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Boak and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I'm I, kinda, I, I just... I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. 
I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. And they got some help with their plan from the very top of the U.S. government. We want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other, the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we can probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. And less than three weeks later, the government of Ukraine was overthrown. The way it went down is that the Ukrainian parliament somehow voted to remove Yanukovych a little under two years before the end of his term in a move that Yanukovych called a coup. Five days later, Yats, the guy, became prime minister of Ukraine. And less than a month later, Ukraine signed that pact with the EU and went back to negotiating with the loan sharks of the IMF for the cash that Ukraine needed. And just two weeks ago, we got another piece of evidence pointing towards our interference in the government of Ukraine. This time from the big mouth of former Vice President Joe Biden, the guy who was tapped by Victoria Nuland to get the deets to stick. Here he is speaking to the Council on Foreign Relations on January 23rd. Well, I, I, I was, not I, I, but it just happened to be that was the assignment I got. I, I, I got all the good ones. Uh, uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine. And... Uh, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired, and they put in place someone who was solid. At the time. So Joe Biden used money to get someone he wanted installed in the Ukrainian government. And see what I mean? They brag about it. <laughs> you know, these are secrets that are hidden in plain sight. And so by March of 2014, less than six months after Yanukovych decided to economically partner with Ukraine's neighbor, his ass was out and Yachts was in. And Ukraine was back on the path towards integrating with Europe. And I can't tell you all the details of what happened. I don't think we're ever going to know. But I'm confident now in saying that we were interfering. And Russia was pissed. You know, if my dumbass is able to see these pieces fit together, you bet that the Russian government was able to see what was happening, too. And so the same day that Yachts became prime minister, Russian troops began arriving on the peninsula that hangs off the southern coast of Ukraine called Crimea, a peninsula that was Russian until 1954 when Russia gave it to Ukraine. Crimea is a peninsula that houses a major Russian military base and is home to their Black Sea fleet. And after seeing the government that had just agreed to partner with them replaced somehow, they decided to take Crimea along with their military base and the shale formation of natural gas. This is what has been branded here in the United States as the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And was it right? Was it wrong? I don't know. But I can at least understand why they did it. And as I documented back when it happened in episode 68 of Congressional Dish, the United States government immediately started giving money to the new government of Ukraine for weapons, military training, and U.S. State Department programs to, among other things, quote, support political and economic reform initiatives by Eastern partnership countries, unquote. Which was necessary because a significant number of Ukrainians who wanted to economically partner with their next door neighbor were pissed off when their government was replaced. And there's been a really nasty civil war raging there ever since. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. We got a president who plays with the facts. With the facts. And then he waves a flag to cover his tracks. As if a lie is alright, in the end will just apply to me. Now we are so damn tired of being. The polar ice caps aren't going away. 
we don't think we can deny it Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. These bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems.